an update on therapeutic plasma exchange. As you know, um, we are in charge of this program here at St. Paul's, and I was asked to sort of give an overview of what we do and why we do it and what the world of Plex looks like nowadays. And when I was making the talk, I initially thought to myself, well, I just did that, didn't I? Um, and I checked, and it was literally six years ago. So now I feel very old. Um, but having said that, um, there is quite a bit to get through, actually. There's been some advances in the technical evolution, albeit not you know, revolutionary in nature. But mostly, I sort of want to give an overview of what plasma exchange looks like in Canada, um, what our program looks like, what type of renal plasma exchange activity we've had, um, some of the controversies in the field of renal plasma exchange. Um, I, I'm sure many of you are aware of the uh, preliminary results of the PEXIVAS trial, and we'll sort of touch upon those uh, as much as we can. And then we'll talk a little bit about future directions. Um, and I promise you that this slide will become very, very relevant um, as we talk about plasma exchange in the future. Um, so, where did this all start? I can't really talk about where we are if we don't go back to how this all started. Um, the concept of the four humors of the human body and how an imbalance of any one of these humors led to either a disease state or a certain temperament um, was re really, really prevalent back in the world of Hippocrates, really. So back then, this is 400 years BC, um, conditions and personality disorders were labeled um, as an imbalance in any one of these four human secretions. And so there was a lot of, um, uh, what should I say, I guess focus at that time for lack of better treatment on ways to restore the balance or clear out an excess of any of these excretions. So that's where purging, catharsis, diuresis, all sort of um, originated. And that's really where the origins of bloodletting sort of um, came in. Um, and my husband asked me if we still do this. and Kind of do, actually. Yeah, just a little bit more fancy. Um, so bloodletting became very, very um, uh, important. Um, and with the evolution of knowledge and a lot more interest in the composition of blood, you know, people figured out that it was really not necessary to perform bloodletting for every single disorder if we were able to isolate or identify where the problem lay. And so the identification that blood consisted of plasma and formed elements like cells and the fact that plasma contains most of the, or all of the plasma pr proteins and all of the solutes that we're sort of interested in was really a very, very um, important step, not just in the world of hematology and fluid and all that, but also in the world of, of what we do today because it sort of forms the basis of extracorporeal therapies, which you know we're, we're sort of doing on a daily basis. So the very first um, uh, plasma exchange procedure that exists, and I actually read the original paper, 1914, performed in small uh, infant dog. Um, a trio of physicians at Hopkins essentially learned that you can bleed out uh, dogs, um, isolate the plasma portion of their blood, reconstitute it with some form of fluid, and then return it back to them. And unfortunately, they had to go through a number of experiments until they sort of realized that A, it's possible, and, and B, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, so it wasn't until about 20 years later when uh, another trio, again out of the United States, published the, the report that actually it is possible to do this repeatedly if you figure out how to reconstitute the blood or the, or the formed cells after you have removed the plasma. And I didn't know this, but this sort of actually paved the way for our understanding of uremia, um, because what they did is they would after they were done with the experiments, sorry for all the do dog owners, but after they were done with the experiments, they would actually perform bilateral nephrectomies and then see how long these dogs could live and if plasma exchange or bleeding them out would, would have an effect on this. So it really paved the way for the understanding of dialysis equipment and machinery, which came actually much later than this. 
Um, so this is how they isolated plasma back then. It was literally a tube of blood and the understanding that certain components of blood um, when exposed to gravity will behave in a different manner. Uh, it was a manual centrifuge machine that was obviously human operated and then it was a human pipetting out the supernatant plasma. And so obviously you can imagine that this you know, really limited the amount of plasma uh, processing that was possible per procedure um, in those little dogs. I think the highest that I saw was 100, maybe 200 cc's. Um, many years later, the first plasma exchange machine came around, which literally looked like this. Um, and I, whenever I see old photographs of medical procedures, I'm always so amazed by how sensational everything was back then, and also how kind of creepy this guy looks <laughs> right here. Um, um, nowadays, or 2013, when I first gave you an update on plasma exchange, on the left is what we were using, the centrifugal um, plasma exchange machine that has now been replaced by the much cooler looking still centrifugal filtration machine. The machinery itself looks fancy, but um, as much like the world of dialysis, um, aside from safety measures and a touch screen and a lot more bells and whistles, the, the, the concept of plasma exchange when performed by centrifuge really hasn't changed. Um, I should mention that you will find literature reports or other people who are performing membrane filtration. We don't do that. It requires a plasma filter hooked up mostly to a Prismaflex machine, which obviously we don't house outside of the ICU. So there are a few centers in Canada that are performing this, um, but the two major centers here in Vancouver do not do that. Centrifugal plasma exchange, as you know, relies on gravity and the forces of gravity allowing you to separate plasma from cells. Um, why? Well, we are no foreigners to the concept of extracorporeal removal of solutes. Um, plasma exchange is indicated when you're trying to achieve one of two major um, uh, uh, goals. One would be removal of a pathogenic plasma substance and the other one would be replacement of a deficient plasma substance. And there should be enough evidence that either one of these conditions is quite directly linked to pathogenesis. So in the world, or in our world, we're very used to small molecule and middle molecule uh, clearance by process of, of, of hemodialysis filtration or both. Um, but there are much larger molecules that live in plasma that are often pathogenic um, that we simply cannot get at with, with diffusive or convective clearances. And that's really where therapeutic plasma exchange plays a role. So what does plasma exchange look like in Canada? Um, if you survey all the centers in Canada, 30 to 40 percent of all PLEX uh, in Canada is supervised by nephrology, which I found kind of interesting to know. The rest is mainly supervised by hematology, and there is a small proportion of centers that are performing, as I mentioned, membrane filtration, and uh, most of those centers uh, are supervised, or most of those programs are supervised by uh, the intensive care physicians. Um, we do play a, a relatively large role in the usage of plasma across the country. So we use about 10% of all plasma that's collected in, um, in the country. Um, how do we remain accountable to each other and up to date and perform you know, procedures up to standard of care? Um, we are all, um, we, we all report and are part of the Canadian apheresis group, uh, which is a, nation, uh, a nationwide uh, group comprised of 43 participating centers um, with input of our data down to granular details of procedure, what type of fluid we used, what the adverse events were, and, and what the indications were. Um, and we meet on a yearly basis uh, which allows us to go through uh, activity center by center, indication by indication, and also update each other on uh, what's new and what's coming in plasma exchange. Um, it sounds, you know, not super exciting, but, you know, it does actually uh, perform most of the Canadian 
um, interest uh, and research in the world of plasma exchange and where it's been really active is in providing algorithms for treatment of certain conditions, TTP being one of them. So the initial 1991 landmark trial that established that you should plex in TTP to save lives actually was performed by the Canadian Aphoresis Group. So what has happened to plasma exchange? So the last time I spoke to you was back here in 2013, where I told you that plasma exchange was on the rise. Um, we had sort of a stagnant few years, and it, you know, the last time we sort of looked at our data in 2016, we were sort of curious to see that there had possibly even been a decline. Um, however, a large proportion of this is um, due to the fact that two major centers had a glitch in their computer system and upload of data, and so there was actually a lot of data missing. On the whole, we think that the trend in plasma exchange continues to rise. Uh, we perform about 16,000 procedures in 2017, which is the last year that I have composite data on. Um, just under 3,000 of those were performed for renal indications, including transplant and non-transplant indications, and we'll get into that. So where are we in, in all of this? So the major players, I only gave you a snapshot of some of the cities. The major players um, in plasma exchange are uh, located out east. Uh, so we've got Toronto and Montreal, uh, as well as London uh, out there. Vancouver, when we combine both the programs, VGH and St. Paul's, were actually one of the top uh, uh, centers in terms of number of plasma exchange procedures performed. However, if we tease it apart, St. Paul's performed 378 procedures uh, in the year of two, 2017, which is more or less, give or take, about where we've been sitting with a little bit of a rise, perhaps, um, over the last few years. So while we may not compare to the really large players, uh, you know, we only here on this side of the bridge are performing more procedures than, you know, all of Kingston, Halifax, Winnipeg, Saskatoon. So our program size is actually quite, quite, quite sizable. So what type of impact is plasma exchange having on Canada and Canadians? Uh, I, we already talked a little bit about, you know, usage of fluids. As you know, we need replacement fluid in order to perform plasma exchange. Most often that comes in the form of 5% albumin and altogether, we, all of our centers combined, we used about 25,000 liters of albumin, which is qu quite a lot when you think about it. Uh, plasma, I already uh, uh, told you about, is just under 5,000 liters, which constitutes about 10% of the nation's supply of plasma. Um, there are some procedures that are still being performed with normal saline, and then we'll talk a little bit about the new player on the block, which is solvent detergent plasma, um, which I, I predict will become more prevalent. So what have we done to Canadians? Um, it's nice to know what the literature quotes you in terms of, you know, when the, when the fellows go through plasma exchange with me and I talk to them about how to counsel on risks and uh, consent, um, we, you know, we go to the literature and what's been uh, quoted in the literature in terms of adverse effects. effects. But um, because of our data reporting, we actually have every single procedure and the adverse effect that was associated with that procedure in our database. And so in 2017, we looked at all of those. And in total, out of just over 16,000 procedures, uh, less than 10% of patients, which is you know, 1,100 or so patients experienced what is uh, considered or graded as a mild to moderate uh, uh, adverse event. So this would be something like, I have a bit of a hive, may or may not be related to plasma or albumin. I have some mild tingling, maybe some paraoral para paresthesia, some cramps related to hypocalcemia. All of this is very irreversible and goes away, has no impact on their regimen or um, their ability to withstand plasma exchange moving forward. So total rate to quote is about less than 10%. Severe reactions, on the other hand, which we classify as either hemodynamic instability, blood pressure drops, citrate toxicity, which is you know, uh, clearly defined as metabolic abnormalities as well as uh, hypocalcemic symptoms, as well as allergic reactions, 
uh, we found in all of Canada 19 patients or 19 procedures, which is much less than 1%. Um, there were no deaths. The two people died on plasma exchange, but both of those died of totally unrelated and predictable causes. It just happened to happen during plasma exchange. So as nephrologists, when we sort of compare this to hemodialysis, it is actually a much safer procedure than hemodialysis. I mean, half our patients are in Trendelenburg, you know, or hemodynamically unstable on any given run. Um, so how do I use the adverse event rates? It depends on how keen I want to be on, plasma ex on providing plasma exchange. If I'm very keen, I downplay this. If I'm not so keen, I upplay it. Um, and we all do that. And I think it's, it's all in the context of how indicated is plasma exchange in the, in, the, in the patient that you're trying to treat. So what about our program? Our program at St. Paul's has been around for a while. As you know, it is supervised by nephrology. I have to remember I'm not just talking to you. Uh, so it is supervised by nephrology. Uh, administration of plasma exchange happens by hemodialysis nurses that have been cross-trained in plasma exchange. And there's been a lot of turnover, but at any given time, we try to have about 20 to 25 nurses with plasma exchange uh, certification. We use the centrifuge machine. Uh, we do not use peripheral IV access, unlike the apheresis program at VGH. Uh, we are very comfortable with, losing, with using dialysis catheters, so we do do that. Um, or if the patient has an existent uh, autologous uh, access, we go ahead and use that. And I think one of the really nice things about our, our program is that we have the ability to provide concurrent plasma exchange and hemodialysis at the same time to a patient. And that becomes quite relevant when we're treating certain renal conditions with, um, you know, anuria, with anuria or significant uh, renal dysfunction. So the program initially started uh, as an attempt to treat quite renal-specific indications. Uh, TTP was really up there as well um, back when the physician in charge was, uh, or the co-physicians in charge were a nephrologist. Um, as well as a hematologist. Uh, we have now expanded and we're treating, as you guys all know, we're treating a lot of renal and quite a lot of non-renal indications as well, and I'll show you some of the data. Uh, we are not just treating inpatients, so a lot of our patients, actually three of them right now, are outpatients. They're traveling in and um, getting their plasma exchange and going back home. And because of plasma exchange being such a complex procedure, we, you know, we where I'm on a texting basis with people at the blood bank, transfusion medicine, heme path, both here as well as VGH, um, and also the VGH paresis unit, because there's been many times where we've had to help each other with patient volume um, in the past. So this is the data for what St. Paul's did in 2017. So this is what the CAG uh, database looks like when you log in. And I'll just draw your attention, so as we said, 378 procedures, um, 33 patients, um, and here are all the indications as inputted by our staff. And we have tried to fine tune our input a little bit, so some of the sort of miscellaneous other we've tried to be a bit more granular about and try to reclassify. But if you look at this, I'll draw your attention to the fact that there are neurological conditions that we're treating, like the ADEMS and the multiple sclerosis and the myasthenia gravis. There are some uh, cases of uh, catastrophic antiphospholipid and cryo that we, were tr that we treated at that time. Um, there is definitely always a few cases of atypical HUS or TTP. But focusing on the renal world, in 2017, you see that there is a big flare for treatment of FSGS especially in the post-transplant setting. Uh, we are treating a lot of anti -G or we treated anti-GBM, uh, rejection of a graft, whether it was renal or heart. And I'll just point to the ANCA, um, mostly because I don't know if that was a true ANCA or a double positive ANCA or what the clinical details surrounding that case were. But I'll point to the fact that two patients were coded as having been treated for ANCA, and we'll touch upon this later on. Obviously, you know where I'm going with this. So where are things 
uh, in terms of uh, renal indications nationwide. So the major renal indications, the top five, continue to be acute antibody-mediated rejection in the brown, post-transplant treatment of uh, focal segmental uh, glomerular sclerosis, which I found a bit surprising. Uh, ANCA was a, you know, a reasonable strong player up until 2017. Anti-GBM, which sort of has waxed and waned over years, but has never really gone away, and I don't think it will. Um, and then a few cases, you know, in the hundreds or so of treatment of native FSGS as well. So knowing that this is where the activity is, let's look at all of these indications and see where we stack up and what we do. So how do we know whether PLEX is indicated? So we use the American Society for Apheresis uh, guidelines that are published and updated every few years or so. They try to do a really exhaustive literature uh, um, uh, review and essentially make it very easy for physicians to look at a one-pager of any given condition and provide you with grade one, two, or three recommendations on whether plasma exchange is potentially indicated, how to do it, what type of fluid to use, and why it might make a difference. So, the 20, I will say that the 2019 clinical guidelines were published uh, or have not officially been published, but it lives in the world of the internet as of yet, um, and it does not have results of Pexivas in it because Pe Pexivas has not been published yet. Um, in the 2019 update, grade one recommendations still include rejection, desensitization, and post-transplant FSGS. So all, it's, it's quite post or peritransplant heavy. Uh, um, and it does include still anti-GBM. I don't think that'll ever go away. Uh, and it does include ANCA. And there are some qualifiers on both of those. So the anti-GBM, the recommendations uh, are to provide plasma exchange, exchange, but to really think about it, if a patient presents dialysis dependent and without any uh, evidence of pulmonary involvement. And that's relevant every month or when, when, when we see patients. I know we have a case right now. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and it does qualify the ANCA and says that you should do or you should consider doing it if you have diffuse alveolar hemorrhage or, and or severe renal involvement. And of course you know that these recommendations are directly derived from the MEPEX trial, which we'll talk about. Um, it, it of course also um, uh, recommends uh, um, uh, PLEX in the, in the treatment of atypical HUS when you know that it's due to a factor H autoantibody, which you never know when the patient presents. Grade two recommendations I, I, I listed, um, so second line therapy in cryo and steroid resistant native FSGS. Myeloma cast is up there, I can tell you we're not doing it. And I can tell you that I haven't heard many recent cases at BGH um, doing this. I'll see what the update is um, at, at the most uh, uh, upcoming uh, CAG meeting. Um, and then here, grade three, where they say there's really, the role is really quite undefined, is renal limited GBM requiring HD, um, which we talked about already over here. I listed the other grade one recommendations, but I will spend no time today speaking about them because uh, I want to sort of focus this on a more renal level. So what did 2019 look like so far? What have we done at plas at, with plasma exchange at St. Paul's? So far, we are at about 234 patients, so it looks like it's been a bit of a slower year. Um, even by the end of the year, I don't think we'll make it up to 370, but again, it waxes and wanes from year to year. So if I exclude the neural causes, which we will continue to have and continue to treat, and we are, uh, I, I don't think that that will change much, I'll draw attention to a number of things. So in blue, we've got TTP or atypical HUS, as well as anti-GBM and pulmonary hemorrhage. Then in red, we've got the transplant indications, including rejection in the heart, rejection in the kidneys, and then, of course, FSGS in, in the post-transplant setting. And you'll see here there are two patients that have chewed through 130 procedures in 2019. So we'll talk about why and, and, and where that's all going. What's missing on this list? There's no anchor. 
right? So we haven't coded an anchor in 2019. Uh, I look back in 2018, we haven't coded an anchor uh, since then. Here, we've been really anchor adverse uh, in terms of treatment of Plex, but we haven't even coded an anchor. So that's, I found that interesting. So how I'll present you the rest of the data um, is going to be in context of recent cases, because I think those have stuck out in my mind. Um, and I decided to present it in descending order or ascending order of controversy, I should say. So we'll start with the easy case. Recently, uh, we took on a 20-year-old uh, male who was previously healthy, works as a chef in a restaurant in Langley, no medications, kind of a dude. Um, mom told me he's got no medical problems other than you know having an anaphylactic reaction to peanuts in the past. Um, and he presented to Langley with a three-day history of nausea and what he noticed was brown urine. Not anura, but brown urine. Uh, these are his labs. I'll just condense. I just condensed them into what you need to know. He had uh, significant renal impairment. His urine was grossly discolored. It looked like uh, brown urine. He was right. His hemoglobin was 82. His platelets were 90 in Langley and 8 by the time I took him, which was only 18 hours later. He had a significant LDH at 1,700, lots of schistocytes. He had absolutely no haptoglobin. His billy was up. He had no evidence of DIC. And I sent his AdamTS by taxi to VGH. And of course, the question is, what do you do now? So if you remember, we talked about atypical HUS and TTP. There is no question that you should treat someone with suspected TTP. There's no question that plasma exchange is uh, the gold therapy, really the gold standard. We, our understanding of the treatment of TTP has evolved a lot. Uh, we, you know, we, we previously uh, used plasma exchange as the only uh, end all and be all of therapy because we know that either removal of the auto inhibitor uh, of, of the uh, uh, inhibitory out of body to Adam TS or replacement of deficient Adam TS uh, m plays a large role in recovery in TTP. Uh, but just so you know, there are other therapies that are used in TTP, including B cell uh, depletion, bortezomib. Uh, there's uh, a recent clinical trial that came out at Kaplazizumab, which I had to practice saying, as well as an infusion of recombinant AdamTS. In clinical practice, I haven't seen this yet, um, but it is on the horizon and there's tons of literature. So there's no question that in a suspected TTP case, you use Plex. Uh, so what the, the difficulty lies in the fact that we are uh, much more vigilant about the recognition of atypical HUS and the fact that many patients who present with what looks like TTP could very well have atypical HUS specifically when they present with significant renal disease. And the, our understanding of atypical HUS has evolved and focuses a lot on complement dysregulation and abnormalities and uh, genetic mutations and abnormalities in the complement system. The problem is that we won't know that when the patient presents. So the right thing to do and the recommendations are still that TTP is used as initial therapy even when you are dealing with a case that you suspect will have atypical HUS for two reasons. Number one, you don't know, so you have to wait for the AdamTS, which takes a day even when you expedite it. Uh, and number two, it can settle things down a little bit. You do see uh, a bit of a blunted hematological maha, um, and you can buy yourself a little bit of time. And number three, when you apply for ecolizumab, they want you to have a few days of plex under your belt before they even consider it, unless your patient is rapidly deteriorating. Um, so for those reasons, uh, in my mind, there's no question that plex is indicated in all patients who present with a worrisome picture. So we plexed them that day. Um, and we used plasma as replacement fluid, and of course, 30 minutes into his run, he, he said, my tongue is swelling, uh, he couldn't breathe, he was short, short of breath, and we had to stop and abort the procedure, and he actually received treatment for anaphylaxis and, um, and required stabilization. 
Why am I telling you that? Uh, well, because it's relevant um, and that uh, we are becoming much more vigilant in recognizing that allergic reactions do happen on plasma exchange. They can be as mild as just urticaria and hives or as significant as anaphylaxis. We knew that these happen because patients are reacting to some form of plasma protein that's present. Uh, but in discussion with my hematopathologist and blood bank, we've seen anaphylactic reactions to plasma in patients who report environmental or food allergies. So the peanut allergy, I think, becomes very, very relevant. And he's now the third patient with a peanut allergy who had an uh, anaphylactic or a very significant reaction to plasma. So STP um, is a product that you'll see, and a lot of the fellows I have to sort of educate on this because they're going to be ordering it if, if necessary, if, if we're not there. Um, solvent detergent plasma is an alternative to plasma. The plasma, con the, the constituency of it is a little bit different, but for our purposes, we don't need to care. What you do need to know about it, is, unlike frozen plasma, where one bag comes from one donor, one bag of SDP comes from hundreds of different donors. And so if I took all of you in the room and all of you had different types of food and different types of things that you have ingested, but I pool your plasma into one bag, the concentration of peanut that Peter and, you know, ingested yesterday is going to be relatively lower than if I took an entire bag from uh, Peter. And so for that reason, SDP is now becoming, there's actually the keg is pushing blood bank to allow us to use it in patients where we either suspect a food allergy or are worried, um, or if we know right off the bat that this person is going to be exposed to a lot of plasma, like if we're treating an anti-GBM, for example, who's bleeding, or if we're treating in TTP, don't wait for the reaction, just go straight to SDP. So you'll, you'll probably see us use it a bit more, um, a bit more often. And also, you are what you eat. Like, who would have thought, you know, you, the concentration of peanuts that you would have ingested and then made it into your plasma actually makes someone else have an anaphylactic reaction. Um, so he did uh, proceed with uh, treatment, uh, and we used SDP plasma, which looks like this, looks just like plasma. And for comparison, I put a picture there of what his plasma looked like on his very first exchange. Um, as you can see, that's what plasma is supposed to look like, and that's <clears throat> what his plasma sort of, those are the, that's the sediment in his plasma, which you can imagine is all heme fragments, right? So this degree, degree of hemolysis is so significant that his plasma uh, came out discolored like this. And now as an aside, the machine actually would not let me do plex on him because it kept detecting RBC fragments and in interface, RBC fragments and in interface, and it was a whole debacle of, of, of us kind of bypassing a hundred different alarms to be able to do this. So you do run into really interesting scenarios once in a while, but certainly very discolored plasma. Oh, trivia. Also discolored plasma. Here's what albumin looks like in comparison. This is what the albumin looks like when this person's plasma was behind it. Any guesses what we might have been treating here or what the substance in that plasma might have been? not heme. Looks gray, greenish, yeah. So 57-year-old doctor from Salmon Arm uh, who took a mox and then had severe liver injury. Billy Rubin was in the 5-600 range and he had what we call suicidal pruritus, uh, ready to kill himself essentially. Um, and of all procedures, we actually had really great response to pl with uh, plasma exchange. So a bit of trivia there. Sometimes the color of the plasma, like urine, is so helpful. So I'll touch a little bit about uh, on, um, on plasma exchange in the transplant setting. These three, uh, these three indications I will not expand on, mostly because it's quite well established that uh, plasma exchange does play a role in all three of them. So whether it is uh, DSA uh, alteration or removal in antibody-mediated rejection or removal of anti-A or anti-B antibodies in ABO-incompatible uh, transplants or anti-HLA 
antibody removal and desensitization procedures. Plasma exchange plays a big role in these. Um, here at our center, we perform a lot of plasma exchange for AMR, a bit of it for ABO incompatible. We've done desensitization in the past, but it hasn't been a hot topic uh, as of yet uh, or as, as of late. Um, but it certainly uh, it is uh, indisputable that we use it all the time. So then let's move on to the next or the, in ascending order of controversy. So 72-year-old patient comes in. Uh, uh, many years ago, he presents with a 30-year history of diabetes, hypertension, and he's quite a large man. Um, between 2006 and 2015, he develops progressive proteinuric chronic kidney disease. His PCR, when he first meets the nephrologist, is 15, and by 2015, it's up to 807. He does not receive a biopsy. The working diagnosis is that he has diabetic nephropathy, perhaps FSGS, secondary in cause, and he starts dialysis in March of 2017. A year later, he receives a live donor transplant from his wife. Uh, his first post-transplant clinic, his urine ACR is 25. The next month, it's 100, and the next month, it's greater than 1,000. It's not a spurious result. He is spilling about 9 to 10 grams of protein per day. He receives a biopsy, and he has clear evidence of segmental sclerosis on, bio, uh, on his biopsy with significant photocyte effacement. So what do we do? Well, we plexed him. He had FSGS. It was post-transplant in nature, and it happened really quickly. So the idea that he may have developed recurrent FSGS obviously was forefront. Um, he was plexed. Between November and February, he received 24 plex treatments, uh, as well as two rituximab doses, and then up titration of his TAC and his ARB and everything else. And he had a reasonably good response. We caught his ACR down to less than 200 on a weaning pr uh, protocol. We took him off plex. And between February and April, his ACR slowly started to rise. And certainly by May, he was back into the nephrotic range. He's now been restarted on plasma exchange. He's receiving it three times per week. He is one of the reasons why we've performed 130 procedures to date. Um, and you know, unfortunately, we're losing the battle with him as it stands right now. I have yet to see a significant response after that initial sort of, it may be working. Uh, more lately, he remains nephrotic, and we are considering him for additional therapy. So what role does plasma exchange play in recurrent post-transplant FSGS? Well, it seems to play a large role. There's a lot of literature, both in children and adults. There was a recent systemic review of involving 70 to 80 cases. Um, and it's all aimed at removal of this uh, luminous glomerular permeability factor, whether that's SUPAR or CD40 or um, CASC or another factor that we have yet to identify, uh, FSGS um, seems to respond in some cases to plasma exchange. And now, the trouble with that is that the regimen can be very variable. Some patients have an, a beautiful and, and, and very swift response in a matter of weeks to months, while others in the literature have reported to require it up to one to two to three years, sometimes even as maintenance, in order to remain subnephrotic. The last three patients that we have treated uh, have given us mixed results. I, we treated a young girl, um, the transplanter or the transplant team will remember, we treated her for almost nine months, uh, and she had absolutely no response, and we eventually gave up. Um, one we uh, treated who remitted very quickly within one to two months. We weaned her very slowly. She relapsed, and she's now back on and weaning again. And the other one I just presented to you. So where the world of, or where the direction of uh, plasma exchange is going here is that there's a lot of actually uh, interest on building clinical prediction models for predicting who is most likely to uh, present with recurrent FSGS. Uh, and I haven't presented any of those models to you because none of them have been verified nor validated, but there are a lot of centers, and one just recently put their experience out there, that have used clinical score scoring uh, systems 
to uh, identify patients at high risk of recurrence and have then used preemptive plasma exchange immediately or peritransplantation in order to mitigate that. And I do think we'll see more of that coming, coming in the future. So next case, 29-year-old man. Um, I actually just recently met him in my office. 29-year-old man who presents to an outside hospital his presenting complaint was three days of anuria. That's it. That's all he had noticed. Uh, of course, the data speaks for itself. He had a very high creatinine of 1,276, an active urine. Uh, he did not seem to have any type of pulmonary involvement. His chest X-ray was, prist uh, was pristine, although his hemoglobin was 112. He had a biopsy done. Um, his anti-GBM, it was consistent with anti-GBM disease. He had 32 out of 37 crescents and a lot of tubular injury. His anti-GBM antibody was 140. His ANCA was negative, and all the other workup was negative. So of course he starts dialysis, but the question really is, do you plex this man? Um, the guidelines would suggest, and some physicians may agree with that, not to do it. He is renal limited anti-GBM disease with no pulmonary involvement. So what do you do? We know that anti-GBM antibodies have been linked directly to the pathogenesis of anti-GBM disease. We know that it is an IgG antibody that reacts with the alveolar and glomerular basement membrane. And we know that different titers of the disease can mean different things. Um, I should mention that there are different assays in use in the province. So when we are receiving phone calls from each other, it's really important to ask what assay the other center is using and what the cutoff for that assay is. In our most recent update here at the, at the centers here, we're using the um, updated EIA assay, and the cutoff for that is less than seven. Some other centers are still using less than 20. In my discussion with the heme pass at BGH, the sensitivity and specificity of these two assays is relatively comparable. If anything, the newer assays are probably less sensitive and more specific. So uh, that's something to, to sort of keep in mind. Previously, we thought that the anti-GBM titer directly correlates with disease activity. And so we were um, not only very vigilant in trying to reduce that titer right down to zero if we could, but we also aimed a lot of therapy at reduction of that titer. But we have all seen that there are cases that come along that really are challenging for us, specifically when it comes to the idea of should we plex this person. So we've had patients that we have treated with very, very high levels um, who have received many treatments of plasma exchange and then continue to have rock-stable, high elevated titers. And the idea of how long do you treat that patient certainly becomes very prevalent. I think our record was, I don't know how we let that happen, but I, th I think we treated someone almost 57 times back in 2015. Um, so what do you do with those patients or with those titers? And what do you do with the reverse? So a, a biopsy or a clinical picture that's consistent with anti-GBM, but you have absolutely no detectable anti-GBM antibody. Of course, you'll phone Mike Nemo and you'll ask him to do the fancy assay and he'll do it and they'll tell you, I still can't see anti-GBM, but what do you do in those cases? And then more recently, this, this came up. Um, whether the two assays are different or not, they are more sensitive than they used to be in the past. So certainly low level anti uh, antibody level positivity still exists. So those are the levels of in the teens, 15s, 20s, high, low 20s, um, which are seen in certain disease states, including infections and inflammatory conditions. And so what do you do in those cases, really? The current uh, literature suggests that we should plex anti-GBM, and it really is probably the disease that has the strongest evidence. And the strongest, I say, is because it has an RCT. But I'll qualify that and say the RCT was from 1985 and included 17 patients. Um, a lot of the other literature is based on observational retrospective and prospective data. However, it is very, very strong in nature. Um, and it is based on the observation that with um, plasma exchange, you can see this is an old slide, with plasma exchange, anti-GBM levels uh, uh, remit very, very, very fast. 
So within 20 days, and which, you know, during that time you can get at least 14 treatments in or so, um, you really get a nice reduction in anti-GBM antibody levels. Now, interestingly, if you do nothing to anti-GBM, those levels do decline. They're, the natural history of anti-GBM is that there's this big surge and then things do decline. However, it is at a very, very slow rate. And so the question is, how comfortable do you feel letting high levels of anti-GBM be present in the blood? And how comfortable do we feel about the possibility that those anti-GBM antibodies, while not initially, may later on proceed to cause alveolar damage? And that's really where I think I can't give you a firm recommendation of what to do. Um, but it probably should be weighed against risks um, and, and, and feasibility and logistics. The current recommendations are to provide daily exchanges. We are quite able to do that here. I know my colleagues at VGH struggle with this, so I know that um, at VGH, I, I think what Gayatri was telling me is she tries to get seven in and then it becomes sort of an every other day as, as much as we can. Um, historically, we want that titer to go as low as we can, um, but we have now curbed our, our, our treatment uh, maximum to 28 cycles at most. So I still don't know what to tell you about whether or not you must plex someone who seems to have renal-limited disease without overt pulmonary hemorrhage. I think it comes down to risks and benefits of, of what and, and potentially even transplantability and time to become uh, time to be eligible to transplant. I will tell you about this man though. Um, I told you I met him in my office and the reason is he received plasma exchange. He got 14 exchanges. Uh, his GBM came down to 33 and we stopped. He remained dialysis dependent for eight months and then he literally came off dialysis and now I see him in my office with a GFR of 30 and his anti-GBM is negative. So take that as it may. So the next and, and final case that we'll talk about is, is, is the one that was quite annoying for me and remains annoying for, for many of us. Uh, recently, a 67-year-old patient uh, literally had to uh, uh, be taken off her Alaskan cruise ship and brought to St. Paul's Hospital. She suffered a respiratory arrest and was intubated at the scene. We could get no medical history other than from her two uh, family members who accompanied her and told us that she had some form of autoimmune kidney problem many years ago. And that's all we had. And we were desperately trying to get in touch with, of course, her um, her physicians back home. Her creatinine was 296. She had an active urine. Uh, she was bronched because of a very, very significantly abnormal chest and CT, uh, chest uh, X-ray and CT. Uh, she had progressive bloody returns on lavages. Her hemoglobin was 84. Uh, of course, ANCAs were sent off, and it came back markedly positive at 7. The cutoff for the ANCA is less than 1.0 uh, by that um, uh, assay. The anti-GBM was negative. Everything else was negative. Uh, when we were initially asked to see her, uh, we had no infectious workup. Later on, within two days, she had a positive finding for influenza A. So, of course, we're called by ICU, and the question is, what do you do? So, I put this slide up there, not because I want to go up, uh, go through it in, in great detail, but only to illustrate that our understanding of ANCA pathogenesis is not as clear as it is with anti-GBM pathogenesis. Um, there's no question that ANCA antibodies play a role in the pathogenesis. There's been uh, animal uh, experiments as well as placental transfer of MPO antibodies resulting in disease that have elucidated, uh, elucidated the fact that MPO ANCA and probably even PR ANCA do play a role in the pathogenesis of ANCA. However, we know that there's more to that story. We're learning a lot more about genetic and environmental factors that are involved in ANCA pathogenesis. Um, we are learning a lot more about the role of B cells and T cell regula dysregulation in, in that whole process. And more, more uh, recently, of course, complement has become a target to look at when it comes to this disease. Um, we have assays to detect ANCA antibodies, both for PR3 and MPO. And depending on where you practice, please look at the cutoffs for those assays because 
while 5.0 might not seem like a big number, it's actually a quite positive result depending on which assay you are using and where you are practicing. But no matter what assay you're using, it's still unclear how to really interpret the results. And so it remains a very divisive condition. We have a lot of literature that's published about the role of PLEX in ANCA, um, but a lot of it is flawed because there is certainly an enrollment bias and a publication bias. Guidelines still suggest the use of PLEX in ANCA. A lot of those, those guidelines are, quite frankly, based on fear and the fact that we know that pulmonary hemorrhage and GBM can be or was treated with uh, ANCA. MEPEX played a role in, in, in uh, motivating us to use um, uh, plasma exchange. And guidelines still, up until this uh, time, continue to be quite cautious and recommend ANCA if there's bleeding in the lungs or severe renal uh, disease. And then here comes PEXIVAS. And I wish I could go through PEXIVAS with you, but I don't have the paper. I do have, however, slides from those people that are really annoying at conferences and take pictures with their iPads of the, of the conference um, uh, talk. But I won't put those up. I will tell you about what PEXIVAS was uh, about, and I'll tell you what's in the public domain. PEXIVAS was an RG RCT of 700 patients over seven years. It included newer relapsed ANCA. And you had to have evidence of severe disease. And severe disease was, uh, was uh, expanded to include anyone really with renal involvement and a GFR of 50. So you didn't have to have a creatinine over 500 to get in. And you had to have lung involvement. And that lung involvement had to be an abnormal chest imaging plus one of either overt hemoptysis, a positive bronch, unexplained anema, anemia, or high DLCO if you couldn't find uh, uh, pulmonary hemorrhage evidence anywhere else. Notable exclusions, uh, I forgot to put it up there, but of course anti-GBM antipositivity. If you have a transplant, if you've had dialysis for a while, or you've had PLEX. So what did ple uh, plasma exchange do? It was a two-by-two two design that looked at PLEX as well as steroid use. But focusing on the PLEX use only, severe ANCA vasculitis um, uh, patients received standard induction therapy with cyclophosphamide or rituximab, depending on center and physician preferability. And then in the plasma exchange, uh, or sorry, in the plasma exchange uh, 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 section of the trial, were either randomized to receive seven plex sessions or no plex. And then within that, there was, of course, the, the uh, two by two design to look at the glucocorticoid use as well. The official results were actually presented a year and a half ago. Uh, however, the publication is, is pending. What has been put out there is that at the primary composite endpoint, which was death from any cause or end-stage renal disease, occurred in 25% of TPE-treated patients and 31% of non-PLEX patients. Um, and uh, the, uh, the subgroup analyses that were put out revealed no, and this is again in the public domain, the subgroup analyses did not find a difference in any of the subgroups that were looked at, whether it was younger patients, patients with severe involvement, patients with PR3 or MPO, patients with either no hemorrhage, mild hemorrhage, or severe hemorrhage, and patients who received or either cyclophosphamide or rituximab therapy. Now, who were these patients? Of course, I don't know the details, but I do know what's been published, which is that in general, patients were in their 60s, and I'll tell you, it looks like they were pretty evenly distributed between the two uh, groups. Patients were in their 60s. Um, there was an, uh, a, a somewhat of a preponderance of, of MPO antibody uh, positivity, about 200 versus 140. Um, any lung hemorrhage was, I've got an H there, 95 and 96, 31 and 30. About 36% of patients in each arm had lung hemorrhage. So that's a significant finding, which, you know, I was worried about whether PEXIVAS would actually enroll anyone with pulmonary hemorrhage because of that physician bias that we do have inherently. But it seems to have captured at least a few of them. Um, and then most importantly, we did include severe renal dysfunction. So uh, about 
30, just under 30 percent of patients did have significant renal involvement. Um, 66 and 74 patients in each group actually were on dialysis at the time. So the initial results or the what's put out there in the public domain about Pexivas is that Plex played absolutely no role in reducing the composite endpoint of death or end-stage renal disease. Of course we need the final publication, um, but I do think and the buzz that it has created over the last year in the world of room and, and all the guidelines is that it probably weak, will weaken the support of it. Uh, but I do expect some backlash just because there are centers still pumping out uh, the use of Plex in pulmonary hemorrhage and encavasculitis. So I think it remains to be seen, um, and we certainly will need to chew through the, um, the full publication when it is available. So what does the future of Plex look like? Uh, if you look at the market, it seems to predict, uh, all predictions are that Plex will continue to rise in use. Of course, compared to dialysis, this is uh, you know, not even a fraction of, of, of the global market share. However, the cost of, uh, and the use of Plex and its machinery and its equipment is expected to rise by all forecasts. Um, the indications that we haven't talked about but that probably will uh, be forefront in terms of expanded applications include C3 nephropathy, FSGS and the native kidney, and then there's a lot of buzz about treatment of other conditions, including Alzheimer's dementia, uh, sepsis and multi-organ failure. We just had one child at BC Children's Hospital treated for this as part of a trial. And then poisonings continue to be forefront um, at uh, sort of expanding the use of, of Plex, especially in animals, believe it or not. But why do I think Plex will flourish? Because there is actually a lot of buzz about the world is aging and a lot of comorbidities and illnesses and ailments that we are dealing with are related to aging or senescence. Um, and the inflammatory basis of this uh, continues to be explored. And there are lots of um, uh, uh, in vitro experiments showing, you know, different inflammatory cytokines and markers and, and oncogenes and everything that's involved in you know, what sets you apart from growing up and actually aging. And uh, someone told me about this and I didn't believe them, but it's actually true that there is a, a hypothetical uh, model out there of a, a group in the United States that used uh, intermittent plasma exchange uh, using plasma from very, very young donors infused into older donors uh, and wants to look at the results of what that does. Uh, it's called the Young Blood Institute. It is currently it is currently looking for volunteers. So if you want to be part of the study or donate to them, um, it, it boggles my mind. But um, certainly, uh, it's out there. And I do think that people will continue to use, you know, all sorts of extracorporeal therapies for treatments of certain things. Um, but I should give them credit. They are not looking at whether your skin looks glowing. Uh, they're looking at functional and cognitive assessments, so mini mental status, you know, um, functional assessments of health, quality of life, and things like that. So you can volunteer for them, or you can just accept the fact that. We're all aging, like I have, um, and I'll open it up for discussions or questions. Any questions from here at St. Paul? Hi, Mary. Thank, thank you for that uh, that talk. I just have a question for you about your opinion about. Uh, about the use or, or, or reliance on anti-GBM ELISA titers to make decisions about plasma exchange in, in anti-GBM disease. So I think it's probably the one disease, as you said, that we, we really believe strongly that plasma exchange can be helpful. 
But we know that the ELISA assays we conventionally use are pretty targeted to the classic good pasture antigen in the non-collagenous 1 region of the alpha-3 subunit. And, but we also know that anti-GBM disease is not actually a disease of one antibody. It's actually a subpopulation of antibodies that ha experience epitope spreading that, that the other antibodies we don't detect for may actually prove to be more pathogenic in terms of driving the disease. And so we're not, we're not testing for those routinely. Uh, we also, um, you know, probably are not really able to t detect those very accurately on, on the ELISA assays that we use. So, so how much do you think our reliance on a, this, this antibody test that we have available simply because it's available to us uh, should, should really guide our decisions around plasma exchange in those unusual cases that either uh, are antibody negative or not responding the way we'd like? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, and I, certainly our view and our practice here has been to to recognize exactly what uh, you have brought to light, um, and you know realize that in patients who have you know significant evidence by pathology or clinical picture of anti-GBM disease, uh, we actually don't care much about whether or not their titer is detectable or what level it is at because of the reasons that you've mentioned. So um, the, the difficulty in those patients uh, lies in the fact that, you know, we don't have what we want, which is we want to follow something and know that it's dropping. Um, so what we've done or what I think is probably a reasonable clinical course of practice is to provide plasma exchange and cap it at a certain number of reasonable treatments, whether that's 7, 14, 28, or whatever, depending on clinical response. Um, so, so I think that use of plasma exchange in non-detectable titers if disease is present is, 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 is in my mind very, very indicated. Um, I think the more difficult part is when you have someone who has ongoing disease uh, and titers have dropped, do you continue treating the, that patient? Or if you have someone who has the opposite, which is uh, they seem to have clinically responded, but the, the detectable anti-GBM titer remains positive. So I think, you know, we had a recent discussion about this. How much can we really rely on any of these tests to guide us? And I don't think we can. I think it's, again, something we take in context, but I certainly wouldn't, some, wouldn't want to withhold plasma exchange in those, uh, in those settings. Do you agree or do you feel different? No, I, I absolutely agree. And, um, you know, perhaps we could, uh, you know, I think it might be great to have a conversation between the plasma Paresis group here and you uh, to have a consensus of, of, of opinion on that because yeah. I, I mean if you have a biopsy that has deposition of anti of linear staining it doesn't matter what your antibody level systemically show mm -hmm. you know that there's a systemic antibody depositing there uh, yeah. and we believe the disease is primarily primarily mediated mm -hmm. by that that antibody so I, I only I only raise it because there's been you know cases even mm -hmm. recently of uh, plasma exchange perhaps not. Uh, not being delivered in a way that reflects perhaps your 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 opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can imagine, with the world of Cerner, uh, I have had to. I've been forced to have lots of discussion with my colleagues. So I'm hoping it'll come up, uh, if you know, if not officially prior to that. So any other questions from BGH or anywhere else? Okay, well, thank you very much for talking.